man, it's great to be with y'all. Excited to uh, be uh, talking to y'all about all that we're learning in this study uh, through uh, biblical manhood. And uh, excited to talk today about men and mentors and uh, what it means for us to be in mentoring relationships. So if you got your Bibles, let's open to Proverbs 18.1 together this morning. Proverbs 18.1 kind of needs to be our main verse when it comes to um, this idea of the all alone wound. In the cer- first several weeks of this study, we've been talking about dad and mom and the way they've impacted us. And the wounds left by our past with them. Last week we started the moving into the present and the need we have as men to combat the loss we feel because of being alone. And so the all alone wound we talked about uh, last week, we, we, we got into the, the definition of that. That the all alone wound is a social, emotional, and spiritual loss caused by a lack of healthy male friendship that results in three things. We talked about loneliness and discouragement. Foolish actions and blind spots and short-sighted masculinity. But Proverbs 18.1 is really our key verse, and I would encourage you to write it down, to memorize it. It's one that's on my mind a lot this year with our goal. Uh, We've talked about this goal of community and diversity, and the community piece of that is to make sure that we as men are not isolated, that we are in community with other men uh, especially. And here's the reason. This is it, Proverbs 18.1. One who isolates himself pursues selfish desires. He rebels against all sound wisdom. Let me read that again. One who isolates himself pursues selfish desires. He rebels against all sound wisdom. So when we as men get alone and we're isolated, we don't have other men around us, then we will go after the things that our selfishness, our flesh wants us to pursue, and we don't have others around us to help us to live with wisdom. We begin to live with foolishness. And so uh, this is why the enemy really wants men to be alone. And this is where he knows we are most vulnerable to attack. You know, the scripture says that Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. And he's always looking for the man who's alone. Because you know the way that a, a lion attacks, right? Is looking for the one in the herd that's out by itself, that's weak, that's, that's disconnected from other uh, animals, because that's the one the lion's going to attack. In the same way, Satan knows that the man that's most vulnerable vulnerable to deception, most vulnerable to lies, most vulnerable to temptation is the man who's isolated and alone. And so this is why this is such a big deal. Last week we talked about three relationships we need as men, if you remember. We talked about needing a mentor, somebody who's ahead of us. We talked about needing a friend, someone who's running beside us. And we talked about needing an apprentice, someone who's coming up behind us that we're pouring into. And last week we talked mainly about the friendship category. We talked about how to be a good friend, how to build friends, how to identify friends, how to invest in those friendships. But moving on this morning uh, past friendship, we want to talk about mentoring. And mentoring is a huge deal. You heard about it already from Mark's testimony this morning. Uh, We need somebody who has been there before us. Uh, You get with your friend, and uh, neither one of you have done something before, and so you kind of talk to each other about it, and and all of it sounds great to both of you because you don't know what you're talking about, right? (laughs) And it sounds good. It's like, hey, let's do this. Okay, great. And you go and you execute that plan that you were thinking about, and the whole thing flops. And then the worst thing that could happen happens. You're talking to another man, and they say, man, you should have called me. What do you mean I should have called you? If you had just taken the time to call me, I could have told you that wasn't going to work. I've done that before. (laughs) You're like, oh, man, if I just had that conversation, how much money would I have saved? How much time would I have saved? How much heartache would I have saved if I had just had that conversation with somebody who's one step ahead of me? Listen, we need mentoring in our lives. And the thing that's important here is we need to be mentoring and we need mentors. And this is not a one-time thing. And I appreciate Mark's testimony this morning about how many different men God's used along his journey and path because the place where you get in your life where you think I'm beyond mentoring, I don't need anybody pouring into me, that's a dangerous place to be, right? Uh, I don't know if you guys follow the El Arroyo signs in Austin. Uh, to me, they, they crack me up. I love this one. It says, when this virus is over, I still want some of y'all to stay away from me, right? Now, what's so funny about that is, is that the reason we're having this conversation about community right now is because we are more tempted during 2020 to isolate. We're more tempted right now. Maybe we're watching uh, online. We're doing this through Zoom instead of being in the room. And it's just like, man, it's just so easy to just kind of turn over and go back to bed. It's just so easy to not show up, to disconnect, to not be in small groups. Like, hey, 
It's the coronavirus, right? Like everybody's got a reason right now to disconnect. Everybody's got a legit reason to not be around other people. And I'm just saying to all of us in the room as men, all of us watching online, that is incredibly dangerous spiritually. And so if we give in to that, and I'm not saying we're foolish, I'm saying we all need to be careful with this virus. What I'm saying is, is we don't need to isolate because isolation is not just deadly, it is so consequential to our day-to-day lives. Every single man needs a mentor in your life. So we wanna talk about learning from the community of men. If you got your Bibles, let's go to Titus 2 together. We're gonna talk about the role of men in mentoring this morning. So if you've got your Bibles, we're in the New Testament, Titus chapter 2. And we want to learn from the community of men. Most of us, whether dad was physically present or not, have learned lots of what it means to be a man from dad. We've talked about that already. Um, None of us would be so bold as to say we've got it all figured out by what dad showed us, intentionally or unintentionally. So what we're saying this morning is whether dad was a bad father or a great father, he didn't give us everything that we needed to be the men God's called us to be. We need the whole community of men, Christian men, who can help fill in the gaps. What happens when, uh, like me, maybe you're different than your dad? This is a question we have to ask. Who am I now going to look to to help me in this next phase of my life in growing in God's design for me as a man? The point I want to make this morning is we need to see the importance of men who've gone before us. Uh, We kid ourselves. This is the number one thing that I want to say to all the young people in the room, especially uh, because this is just a temptation when you're a young person, when you're a teenager. We kid ourselves and we think we've got it all figured out. We get stubborn. We get bullheaded because we think we know better. Our parents, they're outdated. We've got it figured out. We're hip. We're cool. Uh, we look at our dad and their generation, and we say, well, they don't use technology the way we do. They're not as cool as we are. Uh, they, they, they parent different. They do all these things different. The world's changed. They don't understand what I'm going through in my generation. And all of that is a lie. Everything I just said is a lie. Okay? What is true is that men who have gone before us are facing exactly the same struggles, exactly the same same temptations that we are struggling with today. That's what's true. When we get in our mind that we don't need anybody, that uh, we've got it all figured out, that foolish nonsense sets us up to do this, to repeat the sins of the past, to just go on and do exactly what the generation before us did because we didn't humble ourselves and learn. And what happens when you don't have mentors is you fall into traps. You just fall into those pits. So here's a biblical foundation for this idea of mentoring older men, younger men, and community together, Titus 2. Titus 2, 1 and 2 says this. Paul says to Timothy, you are to proclaim these things consistent with sound teaching. Older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible, and sound in faith, love, and endurance. Skip down to verse 6. In the same way, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond, beyond reproach so that any opportunity, uh, so that any opponent will be ashamed because he doesn't have anything bad to say about us. What is Paul getting at here about older men? To me, he's saying older men need to focus on their teaching, their example, and intentionality to invest in the next generation. So three things that he's saying to older men. Notice in verse 1, he wants uh, older men to focus on sound teaching. We need to pass on biblical wisdom and doctrine to the next generation. So here is the just caution. We definitely want to lean into what we've learned through our experience, but when Paul is encouraging Timothy, he's saying, First of all, make sure the older men teach sound teaching, sound biblical doctrine. Because what's most important for us to pass on the next generation is what God says, who God is. Not just what we say, not just what we've learned, but who is God and what has God said. So number one, he says, focus on your teaching. Number two, their example. In verse two, he says, focus on your character. Now, we can't just pass on our teaching because we have to pass on our lives. We can't just say to the next generation, as many people do, uh, do what I say, not what I do. That's garbage, right? We know we reproduce not what we teach. We reproduce who we are. 
We reproduce who we are. Because all of us in this room know we are drawn to character more than instruction. We hear teaching all the time. Okay? But what we need is we need to see men who are doing it. Men who are living it out in their lives that we can learn from. Oh, that's what it looks like to actually be a man of God. Third, notice he, he wants older men to encourage the younger men in word and deed. So there's got to be intentionality here. There's a pattern in Titus 2. Older men to younger men, and I skipped the verses in the middle, which is older women to younger women. So there's this pattern that Paul is, is setting up in the church where he's saying there needs to be intentionality between generations. This is one of the reasons we've spread out, even in this room, some of the younger men in the church that are doing biblical manhood who are in these Zoom groups to be able to be with older men. Because one of the mistakes we're making in this generation is we're isolating the younger generation from the older generation. And so we put the teenagers in the youth group and the children in the children's ministry and the adults over here, and where are those relationships being established? Because what a 16, 17 year old needs is not more 16 and 17 year olds. They got plenty of those. What they need is some 30, 40, 50 year olds who are saying, hey, I've been 16, and I know what that looks like. But we also need some 30, 40, 50, 60 year olds who are intentional of saying, I'm going to build relationships with this younger generation and make sure I'm investing. Shout out to the student ministry and the children's ministry and getting involved in volunteering. Amen? All right, back there. Here we go. So in response, younger men need to focus on their humility to listen and their discernment in listening. Humility and discernment. Humility and discernment. Humility in that young men need to know that arrogance is going to trip them up, right? Arrogance is going to trip them up where they're not going to listen to wisdom from the previous generation. And say, well, I, you know, I know you got some things to, to share with me, old man, but uh, I've seen a YouTube video. I know it already. Now you're laughing, but those are, that's legit. That's the conversations we're having right now. Humility is required when you are uh, getting mentored because you have to listen. You have to set aside, let me give you a phrase, generational pride. You've got to set that aside. We all have this. We all think our generation's the best generation ever. And if every other generation would just learn from us, we would be okay. It's called generational pride. It kills mentoring. It kills mentoring. Humility is required so that we can listen. But we also need discernment. Who are we listening to? If you're not going to be discerning, you are going to find mentors in all the wrong places. Uh, you're going to listen to every guy with a podcast, every guy with a YouTube channel, every guy that's got a television show, everybody that's got a new best-selling book out, and they're going to become your mentors. And I would just warn you, discernment says I need to learn from older men where I see two things, godly character, where I see godly character and effective Christian witness. And when I see those things, then I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to listen to their counsel and their instruction. Even when they say things to me I don't want to hear. Especially when they say things to me I don't want to hear. I'm going to listen to what they have to say. So what kind of mentor do you need? Here's some things a helpful mentor brings. You ready? Number one, they bring wisdom from experience. He's been there before. Maybe he's been successful. More likely than not, he's flopped and been unsuccessful. <laughs> Don't just look for the mentor who's like, you know, been greatly successful at everything they've done. You can learn a lot from somebody's mistakes and the things they've done wrong. Okay? Either way, he's been down the road before you. Does that have to be way down the road? Could just be one step ahead of you and has some wisdom to share with you. Maybe you're in the, that season of parenting where you've got a brand new little one, right? I, I remember that, that time in my life where I brought home my first child and I was just like, what have I gotten myself into? This is insane. This is so disrupted my life. And I was looking for those men that were a little bit ahead of me that had just been through that season, that were able to say, hey, here's some things you need to learn that, that I learned during that season of having young kids. Because I talked to some older guys, and they'd be like, I don't remember that. That was so long ago. So I need some guys close that were just ahead of me. But then I also needed some older guys who had 
been through the whole journey who had said, hey, calm down, Keith. It's going to be over quick. Quit freaking out, right? Because I didn't have perspective. I thought, man, this season's going to go on forever. So you need all these different kind of mentors in your life who can share from their experience. Scripture tells us again and again that wisdom is so important to get in this life. Above all, get wisdom, Proverbs says. And wisdom, remember, is the correct application of truth and knowledge. It's the correct application of truth and knowledge. More than anything, we need wisdom. How do we get it? Listen to Proverbs 13, 20. This ought to be one of your key verses, especially as you're building out your network of other men. Proverbs 13, 20. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Men, are we listening this morning? I know it's early. Are we awake? Hey, listen. If you walk with wise men, you will become wise. Now, what's interesting about Proverbs 13, 20, it doesn't say if you walk with foolish men, you'll become foolish. That's not what it says. It says if you walk with foolish men, you will suffer harm. You will make bad choices in your own life and hurt yourself and hurt others. Listen to what the Proverbs are saying to us. The reason we need mentors is so we make good decisions, not just so we're smart people, so we make good decisions. A helpful mentor has wisdom from experience. Number two, has warnings from mistakes. This guy's not afraid to tell you the things they've done wrong. This is not somebody who's just a yes man, just always saying, yep, all right, you're awesome, you're great, right? This is somebody who's telling you, hey, don't do that. I did that, and it was bad. (laughs) Somebody's willing to acknowledge the mistakes that he's made, the pain that he's walked through. He's able to say to you, hey, don't do what I did. I did what you're doing, and here's how it went wrong in my life. I've got an executive coach right now that I've been meeting with for a couple of years who uh, we do some Zoom calls, and we talk about leadership, executive leadership, and life, and, and And just the dynamics of leading a large organization. And one of the things that's really, really fascinating about talking to this executive coach is he is, he's uh, he's older in his life and he's been through a lot of things. And he, in his personal life, was very, very successful financially, very, very successful in his business. And he blew up his personal life. This was like 20 years ago, okay? He blew up his personal life. He was traveling all the time. Uh, He got into stuff he shouldn't have gotten into. He blew up his first marriage. And so All this went really, really well. All of it went really poorly. It went well professionally and very poor personally. And so he's telling me all this story. And so what's interesting is now as he's been able to like put his life back together personally from that experience and he speaks into my life, when he starts to see little things, not huge things, but just little things that I'm doing, he immediately jumps on them because he has said those things to himself. Like when I start to make excuses about why I haven't taken Barry on a date, or I start to make some excuse about why I haven't spent time with one of my kids or whatever. He's like, uh-uh. He's like, I've done that. Let me tell you where that leads. So you need mentors in your life who've made those mistakes and they know those excuses and they say, don't do that. Don't repeat that pattern. Proverbs 1 uh, is an example of where um, we hear this warning about where life goes if we're headed the wrong direction. Proverbs is a book that you ought to live in. Um, I I tell guys all the time, uh, I I go through a regular rhythm in my life at least once a year to go through Psalms and Proverbs, Psalms and Proverbs. Psalms about your relationship with God, Proverbs about our relationship with each other and just growing in wisdom. It's especially a powerful book when you're young to learn what is wisdom, the book of Proverbs. Uh, But one of the things that's just repeated throughout Proverbs is this idea of father, mother saying to a, a son, hey, listen to our instruction. Listen to our wisdom. And one of the things that this, is, uh, this book repeats is why that's important. In Proverbs 1, 10, listen to this. My son, if sinners entice you, don't be persuaded. If they say, come with us, let us set an ambush and kill someone. Let's attack some innocent person just for fun. So basically, he's setting this scenario up for his son and saying, hey, this is what the temptation is going to look like when it comes your way. There's going to be peer pressure. I mean, there's a group saying, hey, let's go do this. Doesn't this sound fun? Okay, when you listen to it, it sounds ridiculous. We're going to do what? But in the moment, because there's peer pressure and because there's a bunch of people there and because they're making it sound better than it is, it's going to sound great, right? But what is wisdom saying? What is wisdom saying? Down later in the verse, he says in verse 15, my son, don't 
travel that road with them or set foot on their path because their feet run toward evil and they hurry to shed blood. He's telling his son where those paths lead. Here's the temptation, but if you follow that, this is where it's going. And that is the kind of mentoring that we need. That's what I'm describing to you. There are temptations and traps that will derail you as a man, and you need a mentor who will warn you where that is headed. Third, you need a helpful mentor who has passion for Christ above all things, especially as you are seeking to grow as a Christian man. You want to find a mentor who has a genuine passion for Christ. Not just a good dude, not just somebody that's got some life experience, not just somebody who's successful in their business, not just somebody who looks good on the outside, is handsome and has a good family. That's, those are all great things, but that's not the primary thing you're looking for. You're looking for somebody who's got sincere passion for Christ. They've got zeal for Christ in their personal life. Listen to the way Paul talks about it in Philippians 3, 7 and 8. He says, everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You're looking for a mentor who sees the value of Christ over everything else in life. Many times what trips men up in this life is not evil things, but good things that become ultimate things in their lives. Let me say that again. Many times what trips men up is not evil things, but good things that become ultimate things in their lives. They make too much of money, too much of work, too much of achievement, too much of fame, too much of success, too much of sex, too much of reputation. So you need a man in your life, a mentor in your life, who says to you, none of those things are as important as Christ. None of those things are as important as Christ. And you can't just have a guy who's telling you that. You gotta have a guy who's living that. Who you can look in his life and go, wow, Jesus is first in his life, even though he's got all these other things going on. Finally, a mentor brings support rather than competition. Paul talks about this kind of relationship in 1 Corinthians 4, 15. 1 Corinthians 4, 15, he says, you have many instructors in Christ, but he says to the Corinthians, but you don't have many spiritual fathers. And he sees himself as a spiritual father to the Corinthians. And this is what mentoring looks like. When you see younger men as those who need support and encouragement so they can reach their full potential in the kingdom. Think about how you relate to sons, to your actual children. Right? You don't see your biological kids as competition with you. (laughs) You see your biological kids as those that you are hoping the best for, right? You want them to succeed. You want them to do well. And you're you're putting everything you can into it so that they will become the men that God wants them them to be. In the same way in mentoring, we want to be those kind of spiritual fathers. Not seeing other men as competition to us that we need to beat, but seeing these men as ones who need coaching and encouragement. So here's what I want you to do, these four traits. I want you to look for men around you in your life, in your small group, in your extended family, in your friend group. It doesn't have to be just here at City View. It can be in other places as well. But you want to look for these men that you can learn from as mentors, full of wisdom, willing to teach you from their mistakes, a passion that's genuine for Christ, and a heart to support you and to coach you. Once you identify those traits, the hard thing is you got to make the ask. Take the risk to invite a mentor into your life who will meet with you regularly and speak truth into your life. What are the best practices of a mentor? If you're going to be a mentor, what do you do? Let me give you these real quick. Six things that are just best practices of a good mentor. Number one, he chooses to cultivate a relationship with you. Mentoring happens best in the context of relationship, ongoing relationship. And so you guys know we're all busy. we got lots of commitments, things going on. And so you got to have a mentor who's choosing to invest in that relationship. Number two, he both talks and listens. Great mentors have good wisdom to share, but let me give you one other insight. They ask great questions. 
Great mentors ask good questions. They don't let you buy with like kind of that fluffy answer where you're just kind of say, saying something that sounds good. They ask a f- good follow-up question. They say, can I, can I ask you to clarify, what do you mean when you say that? Can you give me an example of where you're doing that? Those kind of questions cut through all the stuff we do where we want to look good and they get to the heart of the matter. And so you need a mentor in your life who knows how to both talk to you but also ask good questions. What's going on? Number three, he's consistent in his lifestyle. You want to be weary, <clears throat> weary of men who talk a good game, but then you see in their personal life they're a total train wreck. Okay, watch out for that. Uh, you want to look for somebody who's consistent in their lifestyle. Number four, he's able to diagnose your real needs. This is a little bit related to the question point I just made, but let me just say again, uh, think about a mentor, a spiritual mentor, like a spiritual doctor. You know, you go to the medical doctor, The medical doctor is trying to diagnose what's going on with you physically. The spiritual mentor is trying to diagnose what's going on with you spiritually, what's going on with you at a heart level. And sometimes that's not obvious, right? Sometimes you don't even know why you're doing what you're doing. And a good mentor will pull that out of you and be able to say, oh, let me show you what's going on in your heart, not just what's going on in your behavior. Remember Proverbs 4.23? Okay, above all, guard your heart for it's the wellspring of life. And so you need a mentor in your life who's able to get to that heart level and speak to that. Number five, he has a heart for your growth. So this is somebody who really genuinely desires good for you. You can tell that, right? You can tell that when you're around a man and they actually desire what's good for you versus seeing you as someone who's competition or threat or not really passionate about that. And finally, someone who points you to Jesus again and again. This is so important because Jesus is the ultimate mentor. We provide seasons of mentoring in other men's life, but what we keep pushing guys to is to Jesus as their ultimate mentor, as the one they need to learn how to walk with who will guide them day by day. Finally, let's get practical this morning in how you find a mentor. You may be listening this morning, you want a mentor, but you're like, I don't know, Keith, how to find one. You know they're important, but you can't really figure out next steps. So let's go there, and let's finish by getting really practical. Number one, you've got to pray for wisdom and guidance. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in this process. Jesus said the Spirit is our counselor and our helper. He helps us. And so if you're sitting there this morning and you're like, man, I I haven't had a mentor since I was in college. I haven't had a mentor since I was in high school. I haven't had somebody poured into me in, in 20 years. Here's the first step. You pray and you engage the Holy Spirit and you ask the Holy Spirit for help. He's the one who guides us in our daily decisions, helps meet our daily needs. So ask the Spirit to show you who you should ask for help to bring the right mentor into your life. Now let me just pause here. The same is true if you're here and you're an older man and you're not mentoring anybody. If you're an older man here and you're not mentoring anybody, and you say, well, I don't know who to mentor. Okay, same first step. Pray, ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom and guidance. God, who do you want me to invest in? Okay, the Lord will make it clear, but here's my challenge to both of you. To, to, whether you're looking for a mentor or you need to be a mentor, here's the challenge for you. You have to step out and take a risk here. you got to obey the Holy Spirit, follow his leadership, and you have to do the second thing, and that is you've got to go ask. You have to ask. If you spot a man that needs a mentor... And you need to mentor somebody, go ask him. Hey, why don't we grab coffee? Let's start meeting. I'd love to mentor you. Or if you're a younger man and you're looking for a mentor and you see a guy, man, I'd love to spend some time with him, go ask him. One of the things we are trying in this study to really press on in men is to challenge you in this area of passivity. Where men sit back, they don't do anything, and then they wake up in 10 years and they're like, man, no guy's ever mentored me. Well, have you ever asked a guy to mentor you? No, but no guy's ever mentored me. So what what are we doing? We're being passive. We're sitting back. Here's what we do as men. We are looking for other people to take responsibility for us. Come on, don't do that. Part of biblical manhood is taking responsibility for yourself and saying, I know I need help in this area. I know you've got some things you can help me with. Can we get together? 
And listen, well, Keith, what if that guy doesn't want to meet with me? What if, what if he doesn't like me? What if he says no to me? Right? This is where the Satan gets in our head. All of our insecurities come up and all of our fears come up. And Well, I'm not going to ask anybody because, A, it shows that I'm weak and I need mentoring. I don't want to come off as weak. I, I, I don't know if he'll accept me and want to spend time with me. And I don't want to get rejected. So i got this fear of rejection going on. And so what happens? You do nothing. Wouldn't it be better to deal with a little bit of rejection or a guy saying, I don't have time right now to meet with you? Wouldn't it be fine, better to deal with that than to deal with years and years of no mentoring in your life? So take the risk. Don't be passive and sit back and wait for it to happen. So many older guys I talk to who've got so much to offer, been walking with Jesus 40, 50 years, genuinely lovers of Jesus, and I'm looking at their lives and they're not mentoring anybody. And what are they saying to me? Nobody's asked me to mentor them. You mean you're waiting on somebody else before you get involved in this? Again, take the initiative. Start praying, God show me who I can invest in, and when God brings that person across your path, don't be passive, step out and ask. You've got to take initiative. The benefits are so good, they're so good, it's worth the risk to pursue being a mentor and to have a mentor in your life. Keep praying. Keep looking, and if it doesn't work out, here's the third one. Try again. Try again. Here's where most men get sidetracked. They have a bad experience in their lives with a season without a mentor. And this is, I've had this conversation repeatedly, where men say to themselves, here's what they say, nobody wants to spend time mentoring me. Or nobody wants to learn anything from me. The enemy begins to feed us this lie that then gets men trapped in isolation. And this is what I see again and again and again. Well, Keith, I can't mentor anybody. I don't have any, I'm still figuring this stuff out. Are you one step ahead of somebody else? Then you got something to offer. Have you been a Christian one minute longer than somebody else? Then you have something to offer. Have you read one more verse of scripture than somebody else? Then you have something to offer. So you need to be mentoring somebody. Have you made some mistakes that you've learned from that you don't want other men to repeat? Then you've got something to offer. And you need to be sharing that with somebody. You need to be mentoring somebody. But also, you need to be humble enough to say, I need other men in my life. And I want you guys to know, listen, I've been walking with Christ for 25 years. I've been a senior pastor now for 13 years. And I still seek out mentors in my life because there's tons of things I don't know. There's tons of things I'm navigating now having older teenage children. I've never done that before. So I've got some men in my life whose kids are grown that I can talk to and say, hey, help me understand. I know you've walked through this. How do I navigate this? I'm talking to some pastors who lead some churches that are larger than City View, that have been pastoring longer than me. Because you know what happens? Even though I've been doing ministry now for 20 years, I experience things I've never experienced before. It still happens. And so it's so helpful to have a guy I can call up and go like, hey, have you ever seen this? This is kind of crazy, but I've never seen this before. What do I do in this situation? Now you all are walking through those circumstances. But do you have a man that you can rely on? We need each other. This is the pitch I'm trying to make to you. We need spiritually mature men who invest in us, who help us take a next step. And listen, and we need to be pouring ourselves out for the next generation. Don't settle for isolation and a lack of mentoring. Okay? If you've had a rough time, if it didn't go well, if somebody said no, if you started well and you quit and it didn't go, try again. Try again. Don't give up. Let me pray for you. God, thanks for these men. <clears throat> Thank you for the time they're investing early on Thursday mornings to grow with you, Jesus. I pray for them. I pray for all those that are watching in our Zoom groups online right now. She'd bless the conversation today. 
God, help us to grow in this space of mentoring and being mentored. God, help that no man would be isolated. We pray against Proverbs 18, 1, that no man would be isolated so that we would follow selfish desires or that we would do things that would be harmful. Lord, we pray that we would be in community and that we would be with men who can help us. God, show us our next step here, not just to understand mentoring, but help us to be in these kind of relationships. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome, guys. Hope you all have a great conversation this morning.